And so I would like to just hand over to Alan, um, who will be moderating the panel. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks again to all of our uh, later afternoon uh, presenters today. I mean, this, this day has just been fantastic. It's been so great to hear everybody's experiences. And um, we wanted, I suppose, to round out our time this afternoon with, I suppose, just some of those high level uh, questions or topics or comments that have come up throughout the course of uh, our afternoon together. And I'm really actually pleasantly surprised that COVID has only really, I suppose, tangentially been uh, discussed. Uh, but I am curious, I suppose that's my first question uh, that I'll pose to uh, to the whole panel. And I, I invite all of our speakers back onto, I suppose, our virtual stage at this stage and looking forward to that conversation. But I suppose one of the first questions that I have in my mind is, has the pandemic been actually uh, something that's regressed progress in this area or has it been an opportunity to really advance uh, teaching and learning through immersive technologies? So yeah, I suppose the broad question, what impact has COVID had on, on this whole area? And throw that open to any of our speakers uh, to, to make comment on that. Louise, I see you uh, put your hand up, please. Over to you. You're on mute there, Louise. Sorry, <laughs> uh, with our, our specific circumstances in the School of Medicine where we, we have it embedded in the curriculum, COVID was actually a wonderful opportunity because the software that had been devised by a very by a large uh, medical provider that we use for teaching radiography, et cetera, uh, they had it in 3D and they immediately reversed and went back to a 2D model but for COVID, um, for COVID reasons, um, in case um, the students couldn't get into the 3D labs, and uh, that now is something that we're keeping on board. And most uh, radiography education centres that are using it will keep that on board as well, because we found it to be really, really useful as a complementary to, to the 3D, and it means the students can use it on laptops. So that's something going forwards that was never even thought about pre-COVID and only came about because of COVID. Um, and I suppose we, we, we learned other teaching methods using 3D rooms and looking through the eye of the user, but via Zoom and via other virtual ways that worked equally as well in small teaching groups, which we would never have dreamt about. We would have always thought we just had to go into the 3D VR suite. Now, it's not exactly the same as being fully immersive, but it was an opportunity that came about. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, at a time when many academic and education staff were dealing with an emergency mode, it's great to see that actually innovation can still occur uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, James and Sean, I know that you were next and then Zaid, so I'll pass over to our colleagues in San Diego State University. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that generally speaking, COVID has been a massive change and technology accelerator. Uh, certainly, we've seen faculty embrace technologies for teaching in ways uh, that we've never seen before. And I think the good news is uh, the genie is out of the bottle. There's no putting it back in. And faculty are not going to abandon the technologies that served them well during the pandemic. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that we might see as an outcome um, with regard to concerns around public health and, and uh, COVID in general moving forward is the potential for students to get um, assigned a head-mounted display um, for a project or for a course um, as opposed to having to share them. I mean, because that's a lot of the concern is right, swapping them back and forth. Um, so we there may be a newfound interest in investing more in the technology. Um, I don't know, Sean, if there's anything you would add. Yeah, and just that a lot of these devices are really designed to be your personalized device. In fact, we were just this morning preparing for a demo this afternoon uh, and setting up a HoloLens 2 device for that. And it was asking me if I wanted to use my iris to authenticate, which anyone that's typed in one of those virtual keyboards knows how annoying that is. So really, I think one to one is where this is going. Super, thank you. Zaid, over to you for a comment as well. Sure. Um, I am actually going to take the other side and say that um, it's actually slowed down um, the use of virtual or virtual, virtual immersive technology. Um, I think that personally, I like to view VR as a very, uh, it's a very premature state. It's a state where 
Um, the, <clears throat> sorry, it's, a state, it's in a state where this technology is available through universities. Like that's where, that's where uh, the computer started with uh, things like the PDP. They started out as tools to be used in offices, to be used at universities for research. Um, and that's where VR is at the moment. Um, there are some consumers that do have VR headsets out there. And, um, but when COVID sort of shut down everything, people lost access to, to that equipment. People lost access to develop on those headsets, those, uh, those resources at a university or a library. Um, and that was a big shock to my, the, the club here, the esports team, um, all the resources on campus for classes and for uh, research. So, uh, but however, I will say that um, the pandemic did offer a lot of people the chance to get um, into virtual reality. I know the Oculus Quest 2 is what came out during the pandemic and like 95% of the people on my esports team are on the esports team and the people that do own VR headsets in our club now own an Oculus Quest 2 and did buy it during the pandemic. So within... Um, for bringing in new people to this virtual immersive technology, I think it's definitely slowed down and it's picking back up again. But for people who were already interested or who had already tried it, I think it definitely gave them the chance to invest more time and money into these technologies. Um, yeah, that's I think that's my personal perspective on that. That's great. Thank you, Zed. I really appreciate that. And uh, just on, I suppose, the issue of sanitizing head uh, sets and devices, I see Jamie there has mentioned the UBC sanitizing stations. We've also added that into our um, our lending offering in, in uh, UCC Library as well. So we wanted to make sure that students had access to these devices and, and uh, made use of a UBC station as well. Thank you. Jerry. I'll pass over to you. I know that you want to come in. Yeah, just to follow up on what was said there, I suppose one of the challenges obviously during COVID was headsets and access to sufficient headsets. But on the flip side of it, it did, from the research perspective, it did throw up some really interesting observations. And the fact that students almost en masse, along with faculty, had moved into this digital space. What's really interesting to us is this idea of accessibility and the understanding that in any population of students, the fully immersive experience is part of the solution. So some may actually decide to work off a desktop. So all of the simulations we developed, students could access first on their phone or a desktop and then progress to the immersive. And in some cases, you know what? The jigsaw might be the solution for some students or 3D printed models that you can begin to construct. So it becomes part of a package. And I think seeing the learning experience and the grounding in pedagogy that everybody, Jamie, Sean and James have spoken of, I think that's the key. Uh, but looking at it as part of the solution that not every student will take that step, some will do and will step back and say, you know what, 2D, that's what works for me, or the physical hands-on. So I think it was really interesting to enable us to explore that and that the digitalization of students had happened already as a consequence. So that, that was really interesting. Absolutely, thank you for making that point. And Jerry, I wonder if you have seen any research that even compares, you know, you're quite right. I appreciate you mentioning that immersive technology doesn't have to actually be a VR headset. It can be a desktop based computer. You still get a, an immersive experience through there. I just wonder, is there is anyone aware of any research that even compares the a VR, a headset based experience versus a more desktop based experience? Yeah, not so much of the research perspective, but even from our students, what was really interesting because they're life science students, okay, which by by their nature are logical thinkers. And what really struck us was the feedback from students who put on the headset, not a frustration, but this somehow it tricked their brain into thinking that they were in a space with a plasmid and that made sense. So that's what the whole fully immersive bit. I mean, I know they're speaking of XR and augmented, but in this case, it was being in that space in that moment. And even though some part of their brain was saying, I am standing in a lab with a physical headset. No, their brain told them you are there. That's the plasmid. Go and explore. So that's the bit that the immersive gives that maybe the 2D desktop doesn't. Uh, and we thought that was really, really interesting. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, there's a really interesting question from Ray that I know has come up uh, in the chat throughout the course of today. And so I want to pull it out. And again, thank you to everyone for your questions. Keep them coming into the chat and we'll do our best. We only have a few minutes left, but we'll do our best to try and, and address as many of them as possible. But what do the panelists believe is the largest, the greatest inhibitor to getting immersive technologies into the classroom as a teaching tool? I'm curious, uh, Orla, I know that you've started to address that question, but I'd, I'd maybe invite yourself to start the conversation 
conversation uh, or, or to start to address the raised question. Yeah, thanks, Alan, and thanks, Ray, for the question. I think there is a kind of a cultural shift. I mean, when we started way back in the day, the internet was essentially for pornography and gambling. It progressed to be about bullying, you know. <laughs> so there is a resistance in some quarters to uh, this type of technology. Or there is a misunderstanding about the nature of immersive environments, about how they may be constructed pedagogically, soundly, and scaffolding the learning and building all of that in. Uh, I think Jerry has given us a great example there of the different as well, styles and approaches to learning. And that essentially we need to realise, of course, that technology is also a pen or a pencil, right? So um, that's how I was trying to frame everything today. And I was delighted that we were bookending uh, my previous Plato reference from 370 BC with a nice Confucius uh, one, you know, from 470. So, um, yeah, so cultural, cultural change and um, resistance to change in general. But I think we just have to keep grounding it all in the research, make it all evidence based. This is, you know, excellence, you know, in terms of the science and the data that we're all producing. And yeah, just keep plugging away. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a comment on that question? What are some of the barriers to uh, integrating this really deeply into the learning and teaching experience? To, I'll go. To, to me, we've always had trouble, you know, when video games came out and you know, we have realistic environments and all this stuff, those haven't even translated into a strong educational, you know, uh, mainly, I don't know if the market's not there. You know, we, we already heard gaming, big market, porn, whatever, this kind of stuff. Education seems to kind of come last. And I just wonder, and maybe the new metaverse type of stuff where we're rewarding ind individual developers and stuff to create things. Um, yeah, I just wonder how we promote that. Great question, thank you. I'm wondering as well, you know, I'm thinking about the vast majority or what I assume to be the vast majority of educators who may feel that the biggest barrier, the biggest inhibitor to them integrating this into their teaching and learning experience is their own confidence and their own um, capability around this technology. And sometimes that starts with access, right? So we've talked a lot about uh, equity of access to these technologies. But what would the panel say to an educator, whether it's an academic, a faculty member, a librarian, and, and uh, an educational technologist, whoever it may be, uh, about getting over that barrier, that sort of uh, competency, confidence piece to begin to explore the, the vast potential that this has in the learning experience. Uh, our colleagues in San Diego, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'd start by saying that this is not a novelty. It's not an amusement ride. This is a legitimate tool to help people learn and that um, there's an opportunity for us to really build on what we know about how people learn. So the, you know, the theoretical construct that has been foundational in the research here has been this ARCS model. Again, looking at really deeply attention, perceived relevance, learner confidence, and their overall satisfaction. That ARCS model has really been uh, helpful in terms of measuring the impact of these tools. So I would say that there's an opportunity for them to reach learners in ways never before possible, uh, and that there's a way to make a contribution to the literature because you know this field is really so new that um, there's very little that has been uh, published in terms of the impact relative to student success. So that that would be my quick answer. And, and I would just quickly add that. Um, our research did show that confidence was the lowest rated of the ARCs um, areas. So there is definitely a barrier at the moment because the devices are so new. And that was with HoloLens 1, which was a little bit, you had to do a very specific kind of pincher motion and bloom motion as they called it. But I will say, if you watch a young person, a child use uh, augmented or virtual reality, it's very natural, right? Because it's literally just moving your head, moving your body especially I know Beat Saber was brought up several times that's uh, very kinesthetic etc whereas if you watch a young person try to type on a QWERTY keyboard uh, you know they literally have to take like classes for that so I would argue this is much more intuitive and as the technology matures it will become more so. Thank you colleagues. Uh, Jerry go ahead and then Louise I think it looks like you're trying to come in as well so we'll go to Jerry and then to Louise. 
Yeah, I just add quickly to that. I think one of the most impressive um, things about today was the fact that everybody spoke about teams. So my advice would be reach out. Is that any academic that's looking at this and wondering how do I actually do this? Well, you don't have to do it on your own. There's expertise available. People are willing to collaborate. Everybody today has spoken about teams. They've all spoken about students. Look at how impressive the student speakers were today. And that's been our experience here in Cork as well. So the willingness is there to share. The willingness is there to engage. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm not a VR technologist. I'm a molecular ecologist. OK, so absolutely naive in that space. And to me, it was magic how you went from a storyboard. It still is into a digital experience, but the expertise is there and people are willing to share. So I would say reach out, um, reach out. And it's an exciting place to be. Thank you, Jerry. Excellent words. Louise, over to you. Uh, we have you on mute again, Louise. <laughs> Constantly on mute. Well, I'd agree. Teams are crucial to this. Teams, teachers who are working teams and learn from each other. But we found with the technology, we aren't VR experts like that. So we're, not, we're, we're certainly not. And we had issues with the software. We had issues with the headsets because we're in a shared space and with lots of headsets together. And it's only over time that we had a couple of people who were who were knowledgeable, who knew how to get over these problems. We still have them because of the different softwares that the universities use that create problems for our VR space that we have to get over whenever Microsoft updates. Do you know what how what impact it could have on our VR suites? So all of that, it's taken us about two years to get more comfortable with, but we're always reaching out. But it, it is important and we're, and we're discussing this within groups internationally using the same software as ourselves. So it isn't easy at the start, you know, but I think it is important to build maybe different networks for different maybe professions that are using specific softwares. That would be a very good resource for people to be able to reach into and know you can reach out to other people and talk to them in similar situations. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I'm wondering how important is um, I suppose a university driven approach to this in the context of, I suppose, higher education or, or the third level education, as we refer to it here. Um, you know, as I hear you all talk about reach out to people, find those folks who can support your um, your attempts to bring immersive technologies into the classroom. I wonder if there's a, a an opportunity for the university to drive a community of practice uh, and maybe it's not necessarily the university itself, maybe or, or perhaps it is, perhaps it's centres for integrated teaching and learning uh, communities. Uh, but I, I suppose I throw that out there as a topic. Is anyone on their campuses experiencing any, I suppose, good practice in terms of bringing together that community, supporting one another? Uh, or I see a comment in there about community practice. Uh, but throw that open to anyone on the panel for comment. Go ahead, uh, San Diego, and then to Jerry. Yeah, uh, I'll say that, you know, one thing here, we were going back and forth saying we keep raising our hand first, we got to back off a little bit. Um, the uh, We have a call for proposals right now for faculty fellows. Uh, we have three funded fellowships uh, that are going to be really important in terms of, you know, faculty uh, here, like elsewhere, you know, the review for tenure and promotion um, is really important for them. This has to count, right, for them. And if you frame it as a fellowship or a grant, um, that counts in terms of that review for tenure and promotion. And so do the publications and research, hopefully funded research um, that might evolve from that fellowship. So that's been uh, a key component here is, is these faculty fellowships. I'd also note that um, it is absolutely essential to have um, support from your senior administration. So here at San Diego State, the president, uh, the chief information officer who I report directly to are extremely supportive of this. In fact, it has been a mandate that we move in this direction, especially as it relates to that expansion of San Diego State into Mission Valley and the Innovation District. Without that senior level executive support, you're not going to have the resources you need to be successful. So I think it's really essential to have that. 
Thank you. Uh, Jerry, over to yourself. Yeah, I just echoed the point in resources, and it goes back to Jamie's point earlier about the international, uh, the international forum. Um, I mean, one of the big game changers for us was the National Forum funding this kind of research. So I think at university level, yes, there's so much expertise there to tap. There's so much pedagogy, so much technology. But you also have to have a national body like the National Forum that's willing to invest in that and to fund this type of research. And I really love the idea of an international forum. I just think it's um, because this is these are international questions and there are cultural geographical issues that could only be solved at an international level. So just echo that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Any other comments on, again, building that idea of an international forum, uh, building that community of practice at the international level? I just would throw in, it's obvious that <clears throat> just from what San Diego State University is showing the big plans because they have support from uh, administration. Not to say that we don't <laughs> have support, but we're more grassroots and so we've cobbled all our libraries together and this kind of stuff. But without these things that we're talking about, yeah, I don't think we can really expand our programs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I want to pick up on a thread that started early actually, it started uh, uh, when Orla um, very clearly put out the call for, uh, if I remember your words rightly Orla, it was uh, aggressively open, uh, this idea of potentially a repository of immersive uh, VR experiences uh, that are openly accessible, that have good metadata behind them, that are findable, uh, that can be integrated easily into our various different systems. I uh, just wondered if anyone wanted to sort of pick up that thread uh, to talk about, again, the importance of uh, curated experiences, uh, particularly as it might relate to, to OERs. Or I might invite you to, to add any additional comments that you might to start us off with. Yeah, I, I think Elise also had a, a great point about treating um, these digital objects as collections because, you know, there are major kind of sustainability issues in the longer term. And one of the ways that we can help faculty to get involved and put in the time and energy, if then they have a really sustainable resource that is citable in terms of all of the uh, hiring, tenure, promotion uh, pieces that we're speaking to as well. So there's a lot from a digital humanities perspective, there's a lot of, um, I suppose, work done on that. So how, you know, we can all perhaps so with our phone or what have you, create a lovely uh, VR or a kind of modeled experience. But what's the difference between that and uh, something we we'll say that Elevate have created that is a deeply scaffolded, well developed learning environment that you know has huge potential, not just for uh, themselves and their students, but arguably as a national resource now that has been funded by um, the National Forum and then arguably internationally as well. So that idea of a federation of, a, I suppose, not just a research infrastructure, but an open educational resource infrastructure that has all of the principles like FAIR, and we could even extend it out maybe to CARE, you know, in terms of how we, um, how we curate, develop, exhibit, represent and maintain these as sustainable resources going forward. So we'd really love to have that conversation with other people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And big thumbs up from San Diego State University as well. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, other nods of heads as well. Elise, just wanted to invite you if you wanted to add any further comment to that or any experience that you've had in thinking about those VR experiences or programmes as curated collections that really resonated with a lot of us. I uh, would love to hear any additional thoughts that you might have. Um. I actually I, I'm struggling to think of something. I guess I'll just say uh, it's a complex topic and we've definitely explored some things. And I think while repositories do work, um, they might not be the best in terms of previewing for users what a VR, a given VR experience will actually look like. So we're leaning more and more towards like finding a way to work within the existing infrastructure but also maybe find a way to uh, make them a little more accessible within the context of uh, people being able to preview vr experiences because a, a institutional repository created for written works is not going to uh, be the ideal format for that in terms of uh, previewing 
Great, thank you. So very conscious of time and uh, I don't want to belabor too much, but there is actually one question that I found uh, from much earlier in the chat and uh, we might finish on it. It's a very sort of practical question, perhaps, or, or pragmatic question. Uh, it's a question from earlier from Ray. As a teacher, there is the aspect of observation during instruction. So you're in the classroom and you're observing uh, engagements and interactions and whatnot. Do you believe, do, do, does the panel believe that VR has lessened that observation or enhanced it? Uh, I just think that's an interesting question. Uh, what impact might VR have on, on how we approach pedagogy uh, and particularly that ob observing in the classroom? I wonder, does anyone want to pick that part up? Zaid, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I can say that uh, there are professors, there is a professor at our university that does study the pedagogy behind uh, VR um, specifically, but we also have a lot of different other researchers that study it too. Uh, Professor Ball has done a paper on this and has uh, put people in different classrooms or, or they're supposed to be learning the same thing, just in different settings. So one's going to be learning in a traditional classroom setting. One's going to be doing a computer simulation model. And the last set is going to be doing a, a VR demo of the solar system was the topic. And uh, he basically tested uh, objectively how well did the students learn the topic and they were all given the same test and to understand uh, how well these students can pick up the topics based on the experience they were given. And it's interesting to look at because the VR, the people who were put in the VR demo uh, picked it up the best, but this can also be attributed to the fact that VR is such a novel thing to students. Um, sometimes when you're given, um, it, when you're learning from a very novel method or something that's not used often, it helps you retain or it helps uh, memory retention when you when it comes to these topics. So the VR demos, in addition to a traditional classroom setting, probably helps a lot more than just a VR classroom or just a virtual classroom. Mixing it up, changing things, keeping students engaged and excited is what it's all about. Super, thank you. What a great note to end on. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all of our speakers, uh, truly. Uh, this has been a really rich engaging uh, afternoon of, of good experience sharing, good knowledge sharing, good uh, topic raising. And I'm personally really grateful for you all uh, in helping start this conversation. And I think I hear a desire to keep it going and to find ways to build up that network uh, together. I just want to very quickly close our session today by saying thank you to everybody. Thank you to all of our attendees for your questions and your comments and in your interactions. I know I didn't even get to, to even a fraction of them it's really great to see the interest uh, that's there. I want to very quickly acknowledge and thank uh, the crew on the ground. Uh, so Stephanie, through her leadership, our colleagues Martin and Molly and Boise and Owen and others who supported today. Uh, your contributions to this have been so appreciated and you've made such a, an excellent seminar come to pass. Uh, and just to sort of say to all our attendees, to all our delegates, uh, again, with thanks to the support from the National Forum, uh, we've been able to bring this seminar uh, to you today and very delighted to do that. As part of that, uh, the National Forum have a, a short uh, survey that uh, Stephanie will circulate to everyone in the coming days. And we would very much appreciate your feedback. It would help us to assess uh, our, our programme today. And as has been mentioned a number of times throughout the day uh, today, the recordings from our uh, paper presentations and our panel conversation that we've just finished, they will be available very shortly. And again, you'll hear from my colleague Stephanie when they are available. Uh, so more, more to come, I suppose. And uh, thanks again to everyone for your contributions. So with that, just shy of the uh, five o'clock GMT our time, a huge thank you to everyone. Uh, thanks for such a good, engaging day. Take care and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Cheerio, everyone.